the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. Let's read the first seven verses. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come under the authority of your word now, we do that with a posture of humility and ask, Lord, that you would speak by the same power that said in the beginning, let there be light, and creation began, by the same power with which your Son spoke and said to the dead man, Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. And the dead man came to life and came forth. By the same power that by your voice through the gospel, sinners hear the good news and believe in Jesus Christ and so live with eternal life. Lord, we ask now today that as we come under your word, you would speak. And that in speaking, Lord, you would bring life to us, to those who are dead and have not yet turned in faith to Jesus Christ, because indeed they cannot that you would speak and that ears would be opened and eyes would be opened and hearts would be opened and Jesus Christ would be received as Lord and Savior. To those of us, Lord, who have followed you for some time and yet struggle with sin. And Lord, we turn away from you so many times, we're prone to wander, that you would speak and that the very life of your voice would call us back again to our good and loving shepherd, the overseer of our souls. That you would speak, Lord and that your people would be joyfully benefiting from it. We ask this for the rest of this service now in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. As I believe we take up an offering, I think. Uh, yes, we are taking up an offering. And, and uh, if you're a visitor, a guest at Beacon Church, we're just glad you're here. Um, I would invite you over for supper and ask you to pay for the meal. Neither would I ask you now to give to the offering. If you're a regular here, we're grateful for your support for this ministry. And I just want to again make a special mention of the prayer meeting on Wednesday night uh, that's at 7 o'clock at Gately Baptist Church. I don't remember the address, something like 898 Royal, Royal Oak Drive, but it's at the intersection of Royal Oak Avenue and Royal Oak Drive. And uh, if you want information about that, send me an email. I'll reply to you with directions. And we're gathering together at the Fireside Room at Gateway Baptist. It's just for us in our church. It's not part of their, it's not one of their events. We're just using the facility uh, as a time to pray together. And, and uh, we had a wonderful time. It was the best prayer meeting I've ever been to a couple of weeks ago when we did this. And I, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating. It really was the best prayer meeting I've ever been to. Uh, it was a wonderful time together. And we'll do this again on Wednesday. We're hoping to make this a regular, uh, every couple of months event within the life of Beacon Church because as we'll see and even as we get into the message today, if there's one thing we need, it's God. And the way we come to God and express our need for Him and watch as He meets that need is prayer. Prayer. So let's join together and invite you to join us on Wednesday evening. Matthew chapter 5, and today the sermon will be in verse 7, and the title of my sermon is, Bitter are the Unmerciful. <clears throat> For some time I've been enjoying a daily habit of reading through the Bible, I try to do this every year. For a long time I, was fall, I fell behind uh, so much through the year that eventually I would finish and March or finish, you know, the book of Revelation in summertime and then, you know, just they got further and further behind. But this year I'm so far on track to 
uh, along with the Bible reading plan I'm following to finish on December 31st. One of the perks, there, there are so many benefits, I can hardly tell you, but one of the perks of reading the Bible daily, in a, through the, Bible, the whole Bible in a year, is you, you start to notice all these passages that you think, what? Have I never seen that before? Have you ever experienced that yourself? Yeah? One of those little passages, I wonder if you've noticed it, comes up in the book of Amos. Amos chapter 6, verse 12, it says, Do horses run on rocks? Does one plow there with oxen? But you have turned justice into poison, and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. That's one of those passages you, you come across that and you just, it stops you in your tracks and you think, what is that saying? It was addressed to the people of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, around the middle of the, what, the, what would that be, the 8th century BC, I think. 8th century BC, so the 750s, something like that. And, and the kingdom of Israel, not long after that, but by about 722, was going to be completely wiped out by the Assyrian Empire. Just absolutely destroyed. The people hauled off. There'd be nothing left. The, the country would be gone. But before that happened, Amos gave that prophecy. And the people of Israel, according to what the word of Amos brings from God, the people of Israel were supposed to fill the land with righteousness. And that righteousness was supposed to produce a crop. It's a metaphor, you see. The righteousness of the people was supposed to produce a crop, what the Lord calls in that verse, the fruit of righteousness. Instead, what did Israel do? They filled the land with unrighteousness. And you could read about that, just take your time and read slowly through First and Second Kings and you'll see. And their unrighteousness produced a crop, but it produced the wrong crop. It produced a harvest of sin and eventually destruction. Instead of fertile ground where the horses could run and, and where crops could grow, as Amos 6.12 points out, instead the people's Israel, the Israel's wickedness was very, very soon going to bring about their own destruction. Homes would be leveled, buildings would be, would be shattered and broken, and the land would be filled with rubble and rocks. And so Amos says, can horses run on rocks? Does a farmer go and, and plow rocks? But you have turned justice into poison. See, God expects to see where his people are. He expects to see justice. Amos says, you've turned justice into poison and the fruit of, unright or the fruit of righteousness into wormwood, bitterness, weeds. Did you know that God expects to see justice among his people? And justice has a broader meaning than just, you know, a judge banging gavel. It has to do with justice for the oppressed. Justice for the poor and the needy, as well as fair and just laws governing the land. Did you know that God expects to see the fruit of righteousness, as Amos puts it, among his people? He expects that his people should be different from other people. God expects that his people, back then Israel, the kingdom of Israel, he expected that Israel should be different from all their other neighboring nations. And so he expects that the local church should be different from the world around us. Isn't that right? Last Sunday we learned about the fourth beatitude in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Look with me at verse 6. You see it there. Matthew 5, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Well, what do you think? Should people who hunger and who thirst for righteousness, and as we saw, who find it, who receive it from God through Jesus Christ to eat and drink righteousness from Christ the Lord and are filled with it, should they, those people, produce some kind of fruit from that righteousness? 
What do you think? Should it make any difference outwardly when a person has found the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ? Should it be visible at all? If you take the people that Jesus is describing in these Beatitudes and you picture them as a land, as a country, would you expect a fertile land where horses can run and farmers can plow and grow things in the ground? Or would you expect a piles of rocks and rubble everywhere? And to apply that, if you think you are a Christian today, and the portrait that Jesus paints in these Beatitudes looks nothing at all like you. Exactly what is it that makes you think you're a Christian? Is your life producing the fruit of righteousness or the results of unrighteousness? Which is it? According to what Jesus himself preached in these Beatitudes, this was his sermon. In the Sermon on the Mount, according to what Jesus preached, the, the true Christian never ends up with rocky ground instead of fertile soil. The true Christian not only hungers for righteousness, he's satisfied by righteousness. That's what verse 6 uh, says. But his appetite for righteousness never goes away. He always hungers and thirsts for righteousness. And now this fifth beatitude, number five in verse seven, about mercy, describes one inevitable result of righteousness as it works its way out in the life of a Christian. So let's back up and let's tackle this as I like to do with three questions. First, where Christian mercy comes from. And second, what Christian mercy does and third, how Christian mercy is learned. So, very simply, a, a where, a what, and a how. First, where does Christian mercy come from? My suggestion to you is this, is that mercy is a fruit of righteousness. Before I, t I take you uh, through what I see as, as what this verse means and how it answers this question, let me, um, and then I'll also have some applications from that. Let me point out just a couple of things about what the words are in verse 7. So we, we're like getting an orientation, we're getting our bearings before we set off on, the, on our journey together on our hike. Verse 7 is a lot like verses 3 to 6. There, there's a lot of repetition, isn't there? Uh, the thing that's different in verse 7 is now the word merciful, and then they shall receive mercy. Let's look at those two words, merciful and shall receive mercy. Merciful, it's an adjective in the original language as it is here. It's an adjective. It, it, it's a plural adjective. It's, it's describing someone, but it's not describing just someone. It's describing people, some people. So it's a plural adjective. It's a description of Christians. These are the happy people, the blessed people, the fortunate people Jesus is talking about in these verses. It's a description of Christians. And they're merciful people, this says. That's what they're like. And the word says, the adjective, the plural adjective, says something about what they are like. They are people who are merciful or sympathetic or compassionate from the heart. In other words, this isn't saying that they seem like merciful people. It's saying they are merciful people. And that's a very different thing, isn't it? Just think about that for a second. How often do you come across someone who you think is one way, but you find out later the person's very different than you thought? I think politicians rely on that principle every time there's a campaign. Then there's the other word, mercy. They shall receive mercy. And th this here, it's a, it's a future tense, it's in the future, and it's a passive verb. 
It's not something they will do, it's something that will happen to them. In the future, it predicts what will happen to these people. So first, they are merciful. Second, getting mercy is something that will happen to them. And the, the first reason then that I'm arguing that Christian mercifulness is a fruit of righteousness is because verse 7, notice this with me, it comes after verse 6. The fifth beatitude comes right after the fourth beatitude. It, Jesus isn't just randomly throwing these things together. There's a purpose behind what he says here in his Sermon on the Mount. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones saw the connection between these two beatitudes like this. And forgive me this somewhat more lengthy quote. Every one of these beatitudes follows the previous one. I have hungered and thirsted after righteousness. I have longed for it. I have seen that I cannot create or produce it and that nobody else can. I have seen my desperate position in the sight of God. I have hungered and thirsted for that righteousness which will put me right with God. That will reconcile me to God and give me a new nature and life. And I have seen it in Christ. I have been filled. I have received it all as a free gift. And then he says this, does it not follow inevitably that my attitude towards everybody else must be completely and entirely changed? Well, doesn't it? This would explain, for example, something else we see later in the New Testament when Paul is writing to the church in Philippi. He didn't start by reprimanding them for, for all of the interpersonal conflicts and, and the selfishness and all the stuff that was going wrong in the church. He didn't demand that they start acting more like Christians. Can you imagine if, if Paul wrote to the letter of the Philippians to the Philippians and he just said, you guys start acting like Christians. The end, Paul. No, Paul started with a prayer. In spite of the, the reason why Philippi, why that church needed a letter from the Apostle, how much they must have needed a letter from the Apostle, in spite of all the needs in the church and the problems in the church and people's sin in the church, Paul started with a prayer. What? Paul, seriously? At a time like this, you're going to pray? These people need to get their act together. You've got to tell them what's what and shape them up. You, you've got to get them to fall into line, Paul, not pray. And Paul's reply, in a sense, is this. The problems in the church are real. But they're symptoms of a, a spiritual problem that's underneath it. They need God to do what only God can do for them what they cannot do for themselves. And when we pray, we are admitting to God that we need Him. We are admitting to God how much we need Him when we pray. And Paul saying basically in, in you know, my words, boy, do we need God right now. So let's pray, he says. And this is how he, he actually said it. Philippians 1. It is my prayer to who? To God. It is my prayer, for what? That your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. What for? What's the end? So that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with, the words of Amos, the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God, Philippians 1, 9-11. He doesn't tell them they need to start showing more love to each other. He, he asks God for it. He doesn't tell them they need to be more knowledgeable and more discerning. He asks God for it. He doesn't tell them they need to do a better job at approving what's excellent and being pure and blameless. He asks God for it. And he doesn't tell them they'd better start showing some evidence of the righteousness that they found in Jesus Christ. He prayed to God for it. 
Because once again, back to Matthew 7, back to the Sermon on the Mount now. When someone becomes poor in spirit, verse 3, or genuinely mourns for their own sin, verse 4, or becomes meek, verse 5, or hungers and thirsts for righteousness, verse 7, right, that was verse 6, it is always because of a miraculous work of God. Do you see the immensity of what God has given you through Jesus? Because verse 7 follows verse 6, because the fifth beatitude follows the fourth beatitude, you have to start seeing mercifulness as a fruit of the righteousness Christians hunger for and Christians find through the Lord Jesus. And that's why near the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus finally says, Ask, and it will be given to you. But then Jesus also is pointing out here that when God changes a Christian, God has a pattern in mind. Let me say that again. When God begins changing you as a Christian, he has a pattern in mind. He has a blueprint. When God starts doing renovations in you, <laughs> like Andrew did in his house, we saw the fruit of that on Friday night, a few of us there, as we saw He's done a wonderful job. But you don't start important renovations without a blueprint, right? Especially if they're particularly complicated. Like changing a person from a sinner into a, a saint. When God starts doing a renovation in your life, he's working from a blueprint. That pattern, that blueprint is Jesus. Does anyone disagree with that? The spiritual DNA that determines the person you are becoming is nothing less than the DNA of Jesus Christ. And therefore, if you are a Christian, being merciful from the heart is not optional. What God has done and what God is doing, praise his holy name, what he is doing in your heart is going to start coming out in your life. And so it's, it's my prayer right now that each one of us in this church will abound more and more with mercifulness as a fruit of the righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Mercifulness must describe who we are. Not just, something we some, not just something we sometimes do. So second, my second question. What does Christian mercy do? And I answer it like this. I want to just say simply, mercy is a fruit you can see. Because I want, I want you to see clearly what visible mercy needs to look like in real life. But as soon as I say that, I realize there's a danger. If I describe what it's supposed to look like, there's a danger of how you're going to get it. And it can be dangerous. I'll give you a couple of examples a little bit later about what it looks like, this mercy. But I also want to make sure that you never try and make yourself merciful. But, but that, that is the sort of thing that you're going to do. If you look at verse 7, and look at verse 7 now. If you look at verse 7 and you see verse 7 as something like, like a condition. Like the mercy here is conditional. Like... What you have to do to get mercy from God, how you have to earn God's mercy is being merciful. And if you misread verse 7 like that, you're in serious danger. And I want to protect you from that. As Jesus said, or it's as if Jesus said, 
Until you become merciful, you're not getting any mercy from me. But did he say that? No. Obviously, obviously, if mercifulness, as we've said, in a Christian is a fruit, it's a fruit, it can't also be a prerequisite for being a Christian. So coming to church, I imagine the only reason people, you know, at least initially, ever come to church is because of a, a deep sense of need for God. And if, if that's not why you came, I'm still glad you're here, but now you need to know how much you need God. We'll make sure that, we'll try to make sure that you learn that. But coming to church and needing to hear whether you recognize your need or not, needing to hear the good news of Jesus Christ as the most desperate thing a soul needs on this earth. And then having some preacher tell you to make yourself more merciful. That's more deadly than a mom telling her young kids to go play in the highway. And that's why Paul prayed for the Philippians that, that God would produce in them the fruit of righteousness. That's why mercifulness in the Sermon on the Mount is the fifth beatitude among beatitudes that you can't possibly live up to on your own. That's why Jesus at last concluded in, in the Sermon on the Mount, ask and you shall receive. That's why mercifulness is a word in the Bible that almost never describes people, but consistently is used to describe God. And I don't want you, I don't want you to go play on the highway. I do not want to see that you're hit by a bus, metaphorically, or, or literally. I don't want you to leave church today and, and, and go start trying to make yourself merciful either. I don't want to see you in that kind of danger. Because I definitely don't want you to miss the point of what Jesus is saying and end up in hell. Mercifulness is not a prerequisite. It's a fruit. And it's not a fruit you can make yourself grow. I want to make sure that you understand this before I tell you what it looks like. But the thing is, if your heart is hard to, towards God, you will no doubt expect God's heart to be hard towards you. If you read verse 7, as though being merciful is how you have to earn God's mercy, you're likely also going to read that line in the Lord's Prayer that way too, where Jesus said, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And you're going to read that and think, in order for God to forgive me, I've got to start forgiving other people. I've got to earn his forgiveness. There's something I have to do before God will accept me. You'll expect his mercy to be no better than yours, as the singer Andrew Peterson put it. And eventually, the mercy that you might force yourself to show to other people, it's going to dry up. Human mercy always does. It fails. When someone betrays you or someone hurts you, especially when you never saw it coming, not from them. Instead of mercy, you'll demand, your, you'll, you'll demand your pound of flesh, right? You want, to, you want them to get what's coming to them, or, or you want to get some kind of satisfaction. And instead of forgiveness, you'll harbor bitterness. And if that's what you become, you will then have no hope that God would ever forgive you. I don't want that for you. You'll expect that God only gives mercy to those who qualify. And I don't want you to think that that's true and so badly miss the truth of the gospel. Okay? I want you to give up trying to do renovations on your own life. 
according to blueprints that you drew with crayons and construction paper. I want you to raise the white flag now and surrender and, and just admit that genuine mercifulness, Christian mercifulness, like forgiveness, is something you just don't have in your heart. You can fake it, you can force it for a while, but it doesn't come from the heart. You just don't have it. What Jesus describes in the Beatitudes is beyond your abilities and your power. And I want, you to, I want you to see, I want to show you that mercifulness is a quality uniquely true of God. And I want you to love him for it. I want to now get you to, to, to take your eyes off of yourself and look to God. Will you do that? I want you to, to fix your eyes on God. Have you ever read what the Bible says about God when it comes to mercifulness? Have you seen it? Exodus 34, verse 6, The Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. 2 Chronicles 30, verse 9, if you return to the Lord, your brothers, your, sorry, if you return to the Lord, your brothers and your children will find compassion with their captors and return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return to him. Psalm 86, verse 15. It, they keep going. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Psalm 103, verse 8, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Are you getting the point? Psalm 111, verse 4, He has caused His wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. Psalm 112, verse 4, Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. Psalm 116, verse 5. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. Psalm 145, verse 8. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Joel 2:13. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Jeremiah 3, verse 12. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord. Return, I will not look on you in anger, for I am merciful, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. This isn't just one or two verses here and there. This is a grand theme of the Bible. This is a great truth that God wants his people to know about him. We need to fix our eyes on this God and see him as he has shown himself to be. If everyone in Israel who believed in God and believed what the, the Bible says, if they'd taken to heart what God is like, they would be eager to extend mercy to others. They would be quick to forgive. If they saw what God is like, that eagerness in their heart to forgive and to show mercy, it would, it, it would just flow. Wouldn't it? But people tend to take their eyes off of God and, and put our hopes in our own efforts or in something else, don't we? And that's why Peter one time asked Jesus how often he was supposed to forgive someone who sinned against him. Like, Lord, where's the limit? Because it's hard. When you don't have mercy in your heart, it's just hard to keep doing that. So Lord Peter said, how many times do I need to keep forgiving someone who keeps sinning against me? And that, that's what we want to know, isn't it? What's the rule? How much mercy is reasonable from us? 
Where's the limit in the real world? So Jesus told a parable. And this is my first example of what mercy needs to look like, Christian mercy. This is a parable of what mercy looks like. I'm retelling it this way. A certain king decided to call him in the debts of people who owed him money. And one man was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And that, just, like that, that was a, such a, a vast fortune. No one would ever earn that in a lifetime. Many lifetimes. And since he couldn't pay up, the king ordered that, that he and his wife and his children and all his possessions should be sold to, to go towards his debt. The king was within his rights. The king was being just. This was what the man deserved. But the man falls on his knees and he begged and he pleaded it, and the king had mercy on him and forgave the entire debt, according to the story that Jesus told. Incredible mercy. Well, right away as the forgiven man left the palace and he saw someone else who, who he remembered owed him about four months wages. And so he seized him and began choking him, demanding full payment right now. And the second man begged and pleaded, but the first man refused to listen. He had a hard heart towards him and he had him thrown into prison. Well, word got back to the king and they brought the first man back to the king and the king was furious with him. And this is how Jesus said it. He said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, his master delivered him to the jailers. And Jesus explained this. He said, so also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. That's Matthew 18, verse 32 and following. That's one way, according to Jesus, that mercy must become visible in those who have received God's mercy. And think for a moment. That 10,000 talents, that that debt that is more than you would ever earn in many lifetimes. It's an absolute unthinkable fortune. That's just, a, that's just a, a figure to imagine what you owe to God that your sin has robbed him of. The glory and worship he deserves from you. There's no number for it. And if you've trusted in Jesus Christ and believed in him and taken shelter under his blood like the Israelites took shelter under the blood of the Passover lamb, he's wiped the whole debt free. He's wiped it off. Mercy must be visible in those who have received mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy, Jesus said. Remember the second example of what mercy needs to look like. Remember how Israel failed to produce the fruit of righteousness and ended up with a land instead filled with rocks and rubble in Amos? And the prophecy and the warning in Amos 6? God pointed out in that passage one of the ways that they, they failed to produce that fruit of righteousness. A few verses before that, he condemned those who feel secure who lie on comfortable beds, those who eat the best food, those who listen to music and enjoy their leisure. He condemned those who drink wine and spend money taking care of their bodies. Why? Because those things are wrong? No. But because they were extravagant when it came to taking care of their own physical needs, they had no compassion, no mercy on others. Visible mercy looks like compassion. Looks like compassion for others. It sees the need, even of the wicked sinner, it sees the need for the gospel. It sees the need for, for the Lord. Visible mercy looks like compassion. And that was what God wanted to see in Israel, but what, what could not be found there. What fruit... Does God see emerging in your life? Self-centeredness? Or mercy? 
producing acts, evidence like forgiveness and compassion for the needy. What fruit? My third question is this. How, Christ, how is Christian mercy learned? We've established how badly we need to see it. How is it learned? I would say this, mercy is a fruit that you learn. And that's not going to satisfy you very much, but let me flesh that out a bit more. Maybe you don't like me stretching this metaphor of fruit too far. Well, just call it an outcome or a result if you, if you prefer. Mercy is an outcome or a result that you must learn. And the point is that, that you need to learn mercy and, and only as you learn it will you become merciful from the heart. And this was a lesson the prophet Jonah learned the hard way. And there's a generation or two before Amos wrote this to Israel in the book of Amos, God sent Jonah on a missionary trip to, to the city of Nineveh. And Jonah at first refused, basically. Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria, the, the empire that had been making life very, very hard for Jonah's people, for Israel. And in 722, a, a number of decades later, Nineveh, Assyria, was going to come back and destroy Israel altogether. Well, Jonah was an Israelite. He didn't want God to forgive the people of Nineveh. He wanted Nineveh to pay. And God said, go and preach a message of warning to the people of Nineveh. And Jonah's thinking, why would I ever go and warn the Ninevites of what's coming? Why would I ever want to do that for them? He wanted to see Nineveh burn. He wanted God to be the wrathful judge. You know that wrathful judge who refuses to forgive people even when they repent and they plead for forgiveness? You know the way so many people today think that God is? He wanted God to actually be like that. Harsh, deaf to cries of hurting people who beg for mercy. And so when God sent Jonah to Nineveh where Mosul, Iraq is today, Jonah bought a ticket on a ship heading to Spain. It's as far as you could go in the other direction at the time. And so God then nearly destroyed that ship in a storm, got the sailors to throw Jonah overboard when, when they realized that he was a missionary of Yahweh gone AWOL. And God sent a giant sea creature to intercept the drowning prophet and to take him and then vomit him back out on dry land pointed in the right direction. Let me just say there that, that if you think it's too hard to believe that Jonah was swallowed <laughs> by a fish, a great fish, let me just point out a couple of things. First, when Jesus refers to Jonah in this event later on in Matthew 12, verse 40, Jesus calls it a sea monster, katos in Greek, not ichthus for fish, but katos, a sea monster. And, and moreover, Jesus said this while Jesus was predicting his own future coming imminent death and resurrection. And if you have problems believing that a prophet of God was swallowed by some sea monster and then regurgitated on the beach uh, a few days later, how are you ever going to accept that the Son of God died on a Roman cross and then on the third day was raised to life again? I mean, one of those, the second one is way harder to swallow, forgive the pun. Way harder to swallow. But if you will believe God sent his son, and he died for sinners, and he was raised again to life, the rest of the Bible is not hard to swallow. Anyway, back to Jonah. When, when he finally got to Nineveh, he preached the very worst possible sermon he could think of. In the Hebrew, it's, it amounts to five words. No introduction, no three-point outline, no illustrations. It's five words. Yet, 40 days, Nineveh will be demolished. He didn't offer to lead them in a prayer of repentance. He didn't say, we'll be here next Sunday too. We will be here next Sunday as well, just so you know. 
He went outside the city waiting to see what God would do. While back in Nineveh, the impact of five words of the word of the Lord was so complete that the king decreed a citywide fast and everyone should be covered in sackcloth, even the animals, to show their repentance while everyone was to cry out to God, the God of Israel, for mercy. And Jonah did not want God to forgive the people who had caused so much suffering for Israel. Jonah did not want God to treat Nineveh with the same mercy that God continually showed to Israel. Do you see? It says in Jonah 4, It displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, isn't this what I said you were going to do? Is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, near Spain today. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? There Jonah was sitting. On the east side of Nineveh, Mosul, Iraq, on the rocky ground in the hot sun, you can imagine. He made a little shelter to give himself a little bit of shade from the sun, and he, he probably prayed that God would destroy the city anyway, in spite of the repentance. And God made a, a plant to grow up over Jonah and provide better shade. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. And the next morning, God sent a worm to eat the plant, and it died. When the sun came up, it got so hot that Jonah prayed to die. And God asked Jonah again a question. Do you do well to be angry for the plant? Jonah's reply, he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night? And should I not pity Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? Jonah 4. That's how the book of Jonah ends. That's it, right there. That's, that's the end of the book of Jonah. That's how the story finishes with no resolution. But God wasn't yet finished with Jonah, was he? How do I know that? Because the book of Jonah exists in the Bible. Who wrote it? I think it was Jonah. If it wasn't Jonah, he told the story to someone else, to another prophet, and they wrote it. Either way, the book of Jonah exists in the Bible as Jonah's personal testimony. Jonah's bitterness showed the lack of mercy in his heart, and God's grace showed the bountiful mercy in his. God saw a city full of wicked sinners and decided to save them by sending the most reluctant preacher from Israel that he could find. God saw that they didn't know their right hand from the left. They, they were totally morally confused and lost. Do you ever see people like that? Those are exactly the kind of people Jesus came to save, as Jesus said, to seek and save the lost. The book of Jonah exists to make hard-hearted people like me and like you and like Jonah into merciful people who have been changed by receiving mercy from God and we learn it from him. It's likely that Jonah wrote it himself. I think it's very likely. But you can tell when you're reading it that Jonah wrote it from the heart. So what's your Nineveh? When someone hurts you or wrongs you, is there this second kind of visible mercy in your life? When you're angered by someone else's sin, 
Do you see yourself as judge or do you see yourself as a fellow sinner? Grateful for God's mercy. Being given an opportunity to show mercy to someone just as hard-hearted as you are. Just as wicked as you are. So here's the question. Is your life producing the fruit of righteousness that you have found in Jesus? His righteousness. Or is it just the rocks and rubble of your own unrighteousness like Israel? Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Let's pray. Father, as a church, we are, as of course you know, Lord, who am I to tell you this, but we are wanting to learn to be more persistent, more devoted in prayer. And so we've got this season of prayer. Father, you've been blessing that, and I thank you for that. We had a wonderful prayer meeting a couple of weeks ago. I thank you for that, Lord. What a gift that was. But now I ask, Lord, that just as, as Paul wrote to the Philippians, as Jesus says, ask and you shall receive, I pray that you would stir our hearts in prayer. I, I ask for a really good turnout on Wednesday night, Lord. As the people called by your name turn to you and pray, as we see so much of our emptiness and so much of your bounty. As we see, Lord, that we believe that we are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ through faith in him. And Lord, we trust you. But Lord, we are so far from what we need to be. So we pray, Father, and we ask that you would do these works in our lives and in our hearts. Show us the beauty and the glory of Jesus. Show us his mercy, your mercy through him. And Lord, make us like him. Please, Father. And as you do that, Lord, as today and tomorrow and the next day and the day after that, as we stumble and fall, as sin trips us up, as we take our eyes off of you and our hearts wander from you, and as your Holy Spirit lovingly convicts us of our sin. Lord, help us to lift our eyes again to you, to see that you are abounding in mercy, to rely upon your steadfast love and the grace that you've promised to all who call upon you through Jesus, through the name of Jesus, Lord. And we ask that again and again and again, you would shower us with your mercifulness, with, Lord, with hope in Jesus Christ, with the rich treasures of the gospel to give us assurance of faith and zeal and eagerness to live lives that are honoring to you, Lord. Shower us again and again and again with mercy, Lord, until we learn it from you. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.